Party favorite game back in the 80s, maybe the 70s. I mean, it's early technology because all it is is a, a vibrating metal plate, just like what's the other stuff called somatic. Uh, this max usually works with powders and maybe water, small particles. Uh, but these are kind of macroscopic particles, they're just uh, little players, uh, you know, the size of miniatures for role playing. It says here is a, you know, something come out of Ohio via the big tournament center these days for this kind of game. I think it was either Kentucky or Illinois. But here's the plate, and uh, here's the, the tap characters. Each one of them has uh, fins underneath of them. Supposedly, if you get the, the novice set, there's absolutely no uh, fins. You kind of think of them as the equivalent of uh, like a rudder. On, on a boat. And, and as you see on the board, those little uh, hex bugs, they, they have like out, outboard rudders. These guys are, are kind of, uh, I don't know, they might be based on weight. But anyway, uh, it's just a normal game of uh, buzzing around. And then uh, you have this quarterback that lets you do a, like a kinetic motion. You stop the board at any time, you'll see some play. It's really boring, but kind of, kind of interesting, like of the kind of play it is. Uh, so you can stop it at any time and do a throw. Supposedly the only real way to actually make any uh, headway in this game of, of almost chance is uh, doing throws because you can't really get up the board very very uh, efficiently. But uh, there's some there's some pretty good uh, like breakaway moves like every once in a while you know just syn uh, synchronistically. I think there's another word for it too. Uh, you know by by just the very definition of chance, you, every once in a while you get a really uh, nice nice play. Uh, there's some work files today for uh, kinematics. You know, the PHCs. I was doing more uh, CSG stuff. Uh, I was setting up tumblers that were filled with uh, particles. This one's got kind of like uh, macaroni blades. I tried uh, diamonds. Uh, I did a little bit of sun signing. You know, like you could do uh, the one that's known as like the solar sign or the Nazi sign, or you add another uh, corner of them, and you end up going past the worst dictator in history, but you start doing parallel ones. You know, it's a kinetic way you don't think about the, the monkey barrel, monkey barrel monkeys. Um, I think it's, I don't know. But they're just set up with a bunch of uh, hoops, and they just uh, synchronistically start to tangle when you, when you chain them together, a long row of uh, monkeys, just pull them out of the barrel. So, wow. Well, Apart. You never know with these uh, save files. But uh, two examples, you can use the grab to check these out. Uh, it's like making my own chain, so you can grab and they, uh, they un untangle. But you can see it's just uh, based on CSGs that put uh, an embedded bore into the object, and uh, you can give it a little bit of a access to. You'd be surprised how many times you accidentally mess up and try to take a circle out of a circle and then what you end up getting is, is a small little lip right on the corner because it's not exactly engineering that I'll go to do. So you get like this little one pixel line that uh, still impedes your movement. So you have to uh, use the cut tool itself to slice stuff apart. 
Uh, I've done laser cuts that look a lot like this, where you just uh, do repeated nestings. If you think about all the combinations of, of uh, potential piece, you know you have your innies and your outies. And uh, you're, you're quite well permutationally limited to three innies, or three outies and one innie. You know, you're just make all the different combinations of these parts. They don't tangle themselves. You have to put springs on them. It's kind of cool to uh, cut these right there and make like a, a two-bar linkage thing so that they have the ability to, if they have enough uh, rejection of velocity, if they hit each other at the right place, then they lock in. But locking in is uh, something we'll talk about a, a bit in, uh, in other uh, parts of this presentation. You can get lost in this, this uh, virtual world. I want to show you this, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, change files. I'm still in Foxfire, but I'm playing on with you. So I got chains. Um, I was doing experiments with uh, rudders. You have two multi, uh, you have uh, stable multi oscillators that look like this. I stabilize them with two synchronized uh, motor axles. It's really hard to get them exactly synchronized. You know, I was originally trying to do kind of the stuff with a, a, a chain or a piston thing on the side of the train, but it's really hard to get those uh, set to work in tandem too. Motors are a little bit iffy. I'll go do you, you set it up to be at a specific power, and then if it just takes kind of like damage from the world around it, it, it just runs less efficiently. And also, if you uh, if you touch them with like the mouse clicker, sometimes it'll it'll stop their uh, real time movement because you're in you know, like a slightly edit mode. But uh, you can see that concept on these. Let me just try to speed up time. See how slow they're moving. Yeah, I was running into issues where I wanted uh, to keep them kind of separate, but uh, AlgaDo doesn't really let you make components; it only makes lets you make groups. So all that messes up is like you can ungroup it and have each individual piece. But the problem was uh, if you like take a, a fulcrum and like put it over other objects, sometimes it'll tether onto them, thinking that it's the uh, part of their system. So it's hard to keep things separate. But it worked quite well just for a second. They were in phase. One was 0 and one was 180. And the two uh, jaw teeth, this time in the uh, sine wave, they were uh, oscillating, allowing water to slowly um, kind of jump across to a uh, kind of higher ground. So this is like the tumbler world. You just give it a play and everything starts rolling. I thought I'd glean some more information off of this uh, kind of experimentation. But the only thing I really learned was uh, over here on this one is that after a while macaroni noodles, they end up like so that none of them want to tangle with the stuff that they're within. So they just kind of become a stable set. Uh, and the cooler thing you can do is like once you set up these, these things, you can change the gravity and the friction around. So I'll turn up friction to full, and you can see that it starts to like sputter a little bit more. But it's hard if you wanted to grab this entire group. You just have to get lucky and grab most of them maybe do a little option uh, selection to grab all of them. But once you have them, they can, uh, you can change their friction. You know, there is zero friction right now. Turn up their friction, and they're like stuck on the wall. So uh, the exact same kind of setup, you can just variate the, uh, the internal uh, values for friction, or restitution, which is the bounciness. But the attraction only has to do with light, uh, which, which we're not really working with. We're just working with the physics ideas. But if you wanted to do that, it's more like light art inside of Algodoo, where 
you can set up lenses and just have a like a, a laser beam that represents like the power of light and then it, it, uh, it bends through stuff. Laser beam is just like the eighth tool down here. Thruster and laser beam, not really covering those yet. But you can see that once you set up a light beam, then it has to react to what's around it. You can change it, uh, its delay so that it lasts longer. So it's a lot like one of those coupler curve markers. This one right here. You can see if I put some tracers on this clumpy stuff. It's hard to get them in here. Probably best to stop the game. Well, it stopped the gravity. Kind of intermittent control in this program. But I haven't showed you the saw teeth one. The greatest inspiration in our source book that I was getting for Algodus was uh, stuff before, uh, before the Renaissance. Right when it got to the Renaissance, things were getting so complicated that you really have trouble emulating it in Algodus. So this, this guy right here is just two gravitating jaws same as the sine waves that I wish I could show you. And uh, you can grab something and turn it into water, sure. And uh, yeah, if you just give it enough time, everything just kind of oscillates to the right. Whoop, except we change the rules of the world. See, it's just, uh, you know, transfer. So uh, the principles of the machines, they all started with, we're trying to get water uphill, because we live uphill. Or um, what other than water? Just usually just mills. Like they use mills to create grinded flour, and you need to automate the, the mill function. So you put it near a, a rotator. That's part of the kind of like a steamboat with the the shuttles. What are those called? Steamboats. Giant water mills in the back of a well, that's kind of up to date for Algodu. In the geometric actions in Algodu, uh, you have the option to glue things together, so it just automatically fixates everything that you have selected into one thing, but it doesn't necessarily really change what it looks like, so it can kind of be uh, distracting. Not sh you, can't, you can't necessarily be sure from, from sight if they're fused or not anymore. Uh, probably the next thing I'll do and now I'll go do is set up one of these, uh, these long chains. Who was this around? Super early. Maybe like 17th, 18th century, 16th century. But all of these uh, levered ladles just uh, slowly teeter-totter water up uphill as long as it's going to get the uh, the full transition. There's some jokes in, in the readings I was looking at about how, uh, you know, the history book that we have machines, about how people, when they invented these things, they would write in the corner, like, uh, I want a third of the water that's pumped uphill to go back into the system to almost like power the system. So a, a couple of them, uh, you know, before physics with equations is really around, they, they postulated the possibilities of uh, perpetual motion machines more as a, you know, like obviously I can just use the energy that this machine makes to, to make that uh, machine continue. So it's a funny idea, but you run, run against efficiencies because it's hard to believe that you could ever, uh, <laughs> especially just a third of the water, hard to believe that you could ever uh, make energy from itself. But that's what we're going to talk about a little bit with the uh, cellular automata, which is a kind of automata, but it's uh, digital. So it's kind of like the anal analogous form compared to the, uh, the little machines that walk around with the, you know, puppeteers, coats, you know. Uh, there's two inventions I wanted to mention to you. Uh, one was just the sticky note. A lot of people just act like the sticky note in itself is a invention, but it's hardly a big deal. It's just a different uh, chemical construction for the 
glue so that the glue particles can't uh, necessarily be uh, super powerful. But uh, recently they came out with this accordion style for dispensing them, you know, if something's around for 20 years, 1980s. Uh, they finally discovered a new way to package it. So the accordion stripe lets you take one and then it nests to the left and then lets you take another and it nests to the right. I think the guy that invented this idea, you know, just accordioning in it, it was, uh, you know, got like a million dollars. Just, just saying, just saying that to three M. Like, let's, let's make it even more interesting. Everyone might know about the vice grip, uh, Mac tools, Snap-on tools. There's a lot of distributors. Some of them even say that they rework them. They just get them from another company. How to handle? Add some extra teeth, change one thing, and then they're allowed to put them back on the market. Just a funny, funny business model. Just being an added value from a, a previously purchased item. But uh, this particular model, it's uh, it's like 50, 60 bucks. But the trick is now is that instead of the vice grip, which you know it goes to attention and it stays there, this one it uh, it has an introductory tension uh, detector that's just mechanically there, so that I can put it on something of any different uh, width. You know, once the teeth lock in, that first um, momentary pressure uh, tells the machine that that's the tense strength that you want. And then it'll clamp to a certain like you know pressures, pressure value. So the pressure value is always the same after the, uh, the uh, initial kind of like uh, axial detection. So you put the same vice grip. This new one's called an uh, automatic. You put it on all of these different ones, and it'll work with the same tension for each size. Whereas the original vice grip, you know, it's good. It's going to give you exactly the tension you want, but you have to tweak it so that the, the teeth get larger, the teeth get smaller. So using a vice grip probably takes you know a couple of turns to, to eyeball the exact tension you want because you have to do just one specific acknowledgement of what tension. For this one, it kind of like smart, smart acknowledges uh, what you're doing, and then on top of that gives you a, a tensioned increment. So hey, if you're using the vice grips all day, why not cut to the chase and get the automatic ones? Uh, just from reviews, I hear that 95% uh, of the uses, they are good enough, but once you actually want the vice grip to clamp with tension, you know, like, that's what it does, then you have to use a real vice grip because it's, it's no compromise, you know, it's not any, any finicky little doohickey that's uh, supposedly making your life easier, it's just like, this is tension based on steel being uh, trapped in these uh, screws and levers. So jumping around, but uh, cellular auto automata, just so you know, I'm going to hopefully show you some videos of my progress in them, and then uh, the original one called the Game of Life. Mathematician said me in Conway invented it. Anyone that does programming knows about Game of Life, just because it's a uh, really the, the coolest way to in, 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 uh, kind of like emancipate uh, a certain amount of expression from a from a, like, you know, a boring old permutation box, which is what a computer is, you know, like what can it do for you? Often the hardest thing is to populate it with, with chaos. You know, uh, computers just bunch of zeros, and you really have to, you know, plant something in it for it to uh, turn into anything possible. But uh, this whole thing is just based on grid. Every cell has a, a response to being in the grid. Uh, you can think of it as like every cell has eight neighbors, and every uh, every cell can be either on or off, high or low. And so you just make a rule for um, every train jump. Like, this guy is black. And his rule is if, if you're, um, you have three black neighbors, then uh, flip. If you have four black neighbors, five, six, seven, two, one. So you have all those amounts of uh, friends, you know? You can take into account like the, what's beside you. Some equations say take into account the four, four uh, square view. Some equations say take into account the, the four cross view. Some count, uh, equations just say take the number of like uh, you know ons. So you just have a number. So if you're eight, then do off. If you're seven, then do on. So it's just setting up this rule set, almost like a little soccer game, where every every cell reacts. And uh, surprisingly, uh, there's certain uh, shapes. In this, uh, this rule set, you know, there's thousands of rule sets you can choose from, but just the principle is you're making, uh, you're generating the next step from the previous step using a rule set. 
So for the original game of uh, life, let's see if we can zoom in on it. It says uh, any cell with fewer than two dies. And by death, you know, that means zero or black, usually. Any, any uh, more than three neighbors dies, uh, two or three neighbors lives. So there's like a sustained uh, possibility. Any dead cell with exactly three neighbors' cells will come to life. And it's a little early to get, in, get into this video, but uh, Stephen Wolfram, he invented this uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, probably going to marry or best Siri, uh, called Wolfram Alpha. And his company, uh, Stephen Wolfram's company, is just based on making this kind of like an auto intelligence search engine uh, solution machine. And I don't know, he's, he's probably like, in a way, like the most intelligent guy of our, our, our time. Because, you know, he just got a. He's just got a computer company that just makes all of his income, but he has all these other weird companies on the side. You know, he's just a, a very sophisticated intellectual entrepreneur. But a lot of this uh, stuff is just meaningless. So they show you pictures of uh, trees and say, like, this is this is genuine uh, computer technology. But he's uh, he's all about streaming these rule sets so that from a rule set you get um, this variated pattern output. And uh, his, his particularly most uh, ingenious concept is just saying that we can learn about um, reality from just uh, going inside of a computer and uh, acknowledging like what the computer responds to. Like, you know, practically asking the computer a question and then it'll make, it'll make patterns or, or revelations that are, uh, you know, slightly intelligent. Every once in a while you put a pattern in that sustains itself and destroys itself enough that it has the, uh, the lambda threshold surfed. And by that, it means that you know it's ever changing. And it, um, supposedly, uh, Ralph Friend will close this uh, talk at like you know an hour and twenty minutes in, saying that uh, like the more the medical world or like the uh, biological world, it has this strange uh, ability to defy the second law of thermodynamics, which is just you know like things dissipate in entropy. Like something about life has uh, this this uh, this lambda threshold thing where it can self-compose be it through a mitosis or what mitochondria do, but somehow like more energy. It's like the only perpetual motion machine we know of is you know, the mystery of life. And so oftentimes the computer programmers like Conway in the 70s and Wolfram these days are, are trying to uh, approach the mystery of, of life through a computer learning. Uh, more interestingly, this, this video will give a, a little TV. example of uh, we put together a few simple rules. We got to systems where we were seeing emergent from the example of, of things that we can do. With so these who's talking as well, right? Who's like the guy behind SimCity back in the 80s? He made the first like uh, simulation game, which is fitting. And he's talking with Brian Eno, who's like the father of animate music. So it's a pretty cool conversation. What he's showing you right now is a, a live permutation of the, like a Conway game. And this one in particular has a great uh, living state. It's got a, a functional machine. I just put a little. See, this is, a, this is a little machine, you see. Yeah, a very loud little machine. And I can, like, put one little cell in the wrong spot here, and very quickly the whole thing just kind of uh, goes very across. Very sensitive. <laughs> uh, that was, you know, one cell and... Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot about signal transmission. Each one of these little, uh, like, living forms in the, the game of life has, has certain possibilities of uh, interchange with, you know, if it, if it encounters it's a, uh, you know, another thing that is uh, you know, a little, I think, uh, Wolfram called it meta-active. So it's City, still, almost like uh, Algo did. The game worked on many years ago. In fact, is underlaid by just a set of very simple state of automata like this. For, you know, they have very simple rules for things like crime and traffic and pollution. It was a much more complex simulation than, in fact, it really was. Let's find out. View painting. And it's interesting just because... Yeah, this is just a, an algorithm that draws these people. It's the most famous one out there because it didn't use a, a machine to do it. It just does a software. So uh, a guy just taught a computer how to do portrait drawing, you know, follow a couple instructions. All right, I know you want to see this. Uh, this is how electric football goes down. Somebody had a nice little ball. 
and then you have to kind of get across the space. And then every time ever that crowd ball is touched, he slows the stop for more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's a he's mid American guy, he's a lot. And so what it is a lot is that you just place the guys and you try to get them in the green to go and like, chase each other. Hold it slow. Jerry, oh, it's a little Jerry. Okay, yeah, yeah, 30. Third. All right. Mark that play down. All plays count. If you got to the 30, isn't that a first down? You got to get to the 29. Okay, you got to get to the 29. Okay, 4 for 1. It's Kendall ball. What are you driving? He's a little bit like he's 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 a, he's a, These characters are your variables. Keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on them. Well, I'm going to tell you about that because the characters are wandering. Who's Brian Hanley? More introduction is needed. This bum is Greg King. I think Greg's going to have fun. This game's all about positioning. Go to the box. A lot like pinball where a lot of people don't believe it's a stand still. But watch this play. Versus like Tampa, we'll sit in on the play here. Man, a ball at the 33. Here we go, you're right. Good. All right, start the clock back up. The middle. Yeah. Adjustments, just a quarterback substitution. Quarterback. Oh, he's probably going for it. Count him down. What's that going for? 3-1. 86. Veteran? 87. All right, here's quarterback substitution. 6, 5, 4, got him. Turn him up. A little slingshot. So now that guy's got the ball now. The uh, defender guy's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to go after him. Did you see the, that tackle? That was really good. got another two. Okay, uh, popular culture's got a lot to say about looking for golf. Finally, tonight we will review the latest documentary from Ken Burns, who brought us the Civil War and baseball. It's a new 29 hour epic entitled Electric Football. Here's a clip from episode 17. This game sucks. If you ask me, electric football is a metaphor for America. Always shaking, always noisy, never really knowing where it's going. Time for one last play, coach. Hold on, I'm working it out. Okay. After you vibrate that way, two of you fall down. Nelson, you just spin around in a circle. Okay, slightly related to electric football is a magnet fluid. I'm trying to make it myself before. It's just a matter of putting like kerosene, steel wool, hair chloride, and like some oil together. I don't think I succeeded, but you can buy it, you know. This, this little thing on the screen is probably like this big. And, you know, that means it costs like, you know, less than $100 worth of this black food. But, you know, yeah. If it's, uh, if it's magnetized, then it gets uh, involved with the each other's particles. The trick is that the particles are suspended in liquid, so they in a way don't have a chance to ever say, I'm done moving. They always have to go to the exact point of like, uh, magnetic uh, kind of like empowerment. So you, some people do performance work where they just like hide beneath the surface of a, a trash bag and, or, and have like a buddy like on top with another magnet. And then they just like move the magnets around and then you'll get kind of cool uh, you know, crab monsters like this. But keep in mind, this is probably like two inches by four inches. It's a very small world.
But it's a lot like Tacitus' work. Where the Magnus kind of choose what uh, what the arc becomes. I'm sure a lot of horror movies would enjoy this kind of uh, monster. Some people have gone so far as to make sculptures out of metal that were intentionally like uh, uh, magnetically active so that uh, the ferrofluid would almost like mechanically walk up spiral stairways and stuff like that. But if uh, we're gonna talk about metal, metal fluids, we probably have to go over to look and see if uh, the mercury fountain is available for viewing. It was Calder's first big commission. Mercury used to be a kid's toy. If it's cold out, it would turn into kind of like a an, a, a meta slime in your hands, like silly putty. But a lot of pump designs don't even care what's being pumped as long as there's fluid, so it makes a lot of sense that uh, Calder would push the envelope. Uh, in in related field of uh, syndicology, they've uh, started to do play with non newtonian fluids. I don't really know the physics of them, but they are particular like particles that, when they're under stress, then they have a certain amount more tension or a more connection to uh, themselves. Yeah, so this this is just cornstarch and water, and I was trying to get out of a base looper. There's just certain stabilities in the, the sounds attenuate the cornstarch into solidity. It's very pretty weird. Pretty but as you can see, uh, just like somatics with the sand on the surface, usually it finds a place where it's kind of done. Like it ejects the rest of the stuff and it's like stable. So if you're going to use this stuff for like sculptural purposes, yeah, you probably play a, a song in it so that it, it was never entirely stable always transitioning. And then you probably have to have a feed or a basin so that the material goes back in to reanimate. Pretty fun. All you have to do is uh, put some electrical tape right here. Uh, searching around for that, I couldn't help but uh, bring this picture up. Uh, this one, uh, the symposium for uh, like electronic uh, microscope competition. And it was all about uh, electron microscope technicians having their job is just to look for failures in circuits. And so every once in a while when they find something that's a little bit cooler than just a straight up fail, they, uh, you know, the uh, autonomous activity of this uh, polyimide surface. And then some kind of reactive ion process made, made these little, uh, you know, almost like non-Newtonian beings just pop up. And, and if you're if you're saying an uh, electron microscope, you know this is this is smaller than a particle of sand, but it's got a similar principle to what we what we might also see in other other domains of, of you know physical modeling and fun. They they really build up the hype for this. Uh, it's just a a Latin America TV show, and that's just a giant uh, pit of cornstarch water, and you know you give it enough tension, then it'll sustain you. You can walk across water. So this guy, he's holding his balance, and then he gives up and gives a gives the Newtonian fluid a chance to uh, become a liquid again. But I just really like that, how he, it takes him a while to fall, because he's, he's uh, directly interacted with kind of like the relaxing particle. And uh, the relaxing particle reminded me of a, 
this old science fiction movie called Dune. There's this great uh, shield mechanism they have so that when they get into battles, they just turn on their, their shield. And this particular um, sci-fi concept is the you're protected from things that are fast. Maybe, maybe the inherent energy of, of Patrick Stewart trying to slash you with a fast blade uh, is kind of like repelled. And so the way you kill someone in this uh, sci-fi world is you have to like slowly stab. Poor Patrick Stewart. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's proof right there. You know, the cornstarch, as a non neutral fluid, is a certain uh, you know, truth to that concept that you have to attack slowly to get through a, a cornstarch field. All right, uh, some work by Ben Cowden again. He was uh, over at the artist residency at Recology last year, or this year still. And uh, looking at some of his earlier work, I was uh, pleasantly surprised with a couple of his pieces. Plexiglass and then certain six six tubes, and somewhere he's got pistons. <laughs> well, the uh, calipi is probably getting its own piston, so all you have to do is get a linkage oscillating with calipi. <laughs> Here's a completely mechanical analog uh, to kind of like the crane catching toy game. I was surprised at this one because it is done on steel wire. So that little filament, yeah, so hold the two steel wires in the boots. Thank God it's allowed to work with the kind of like slide orifices, just the exact mill piece of metal that gives exactly no uh, like sideways movement to a new steel wire makes like a smooth system. So he, he, he's got a mill, that's what he, he's known for. Uh, you can see that the lower one is a little lower. This one goes through and then above it, and like micro above it, that one goes through, and then full assembly is like that. Uh, I don't know, how about a game, which is interesting. Uh, what, what kind of game can you make? You can see that uh, they were all both triangles, so in theory maybe you're trying to like defend your home or something, or if two triangles interact and they're on that exact swivel, this one will, it has a little bit more force, it'll rotate this guy around. So you can think of that game like you have like a carrot that's trying to divide the other character. His early, early work just incorporated pawns, and he put the pawns on linkages, and he, you know, he'd set up a concept, a psychological concept. You know, these are people meeting. This is like almost a network of, of relationships, you know, or or the, the flow of time. He could have based this on people he knew. You know, he just found out when there were like friendships and stuff, and then he created a machine that uh, held that like social system uh, afloat. You know, I'm pretty sure that that spring, you know, it, it, it looks like a found object, you know? And it's a pretty cool concept. And, uh, he makes those gears himself on the mill, has to drill each, each little zone probably. It's a pretty cool concept to, to find a uh, found object and then inherit its, uh, its, its spatial properties with a, like a, a rectification, like a mechanical rectified object.
but it's weird uh, this particular piece because it's got the whole mechanical world like he's 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 stuck he's got to do mechanical art but he's also got to make it human he's got to bring us back into it this is my favorite piece uh, he did I don't I don't you know because I like uh, like flesh art meat art you know like stuff that makes you kind of cringe when you see what's happening so it's like a silicone tongue and the other his other claim to fame is he does a lot of uh, like offset bearing systems so that one motion does like a he a, a haw kind of uh, uh, rotational thing as well as like the linear actuator so both of those are integrated he's, he's got a, a two control system currently on this one but I don't know he's always putting a, a play on the names of his piece eating my cake and having it too and uh, you know regularly incorporating a a visceral action or a, an emotional human thing on top of all the mechanics, so you kind of enjoy both both sides of the art. And again, he's got the uh, universal or uh, the, the infinite corkscrew uh, worm gear, probably from a, a spring he found. Disgusting, but that, that's how art's probably best served. Uh, out in New York, instead of San Francisco, uh, Eric Singer, who's uh, one of the guys that both put together Cyclops for computer uh, vision recognition, as well as put together the Megatron for, uh, it was like an early Arduino. He's trying to sell them off for 99 bucks nowadays, which is probably not worth it at this point. But I bought one back when it was 150 bucks. And uh, it, it cracked. What, what it was is that you, uh, you have like, you know, 10 ins, 20 outs for analog or digital communication, so you can put sensors on it or output the lights and whatnot. But it would, uh, instead of com uh, com uh, communicating with the computer in any language, it would communicate with MIDI, which is just uh, musical musical notes. So it was made to be a microprocessor that automatically controls, uh, controls musical instruments, or uses musical instruments language to uh, communicate to the computer. But his claim to fame, I don't know, it's, it's already five years old, but he's got a family now, is the uh, guitar bot. Sadly, it has no guitar in it. All it has is a stepper motor picks, there's four of them in a row, so he only has to go so far to get the next pick. Or from wherever you are, you, you always have maybe like two kinds of picking with either direction you go to. You get like the, the, the downstream or the upstream, which supposedly like uh, acoustically are, are different. Aficionados spend, spend their entire life pick, picking a guitar and like trying to make it so that their up and their down is the same or, uh, you know, Inheriting the different possibility of what an up and a down can do. Oh, and check out the music effects. But it's a good song, which means that like this guitarist is like rocking out. You know, he's like kind of lean back while he's playing. But this machine, it doesn't have a a relaxation. You know, it doesn't have like a hydraulic system so that it can relax. <laughs> uh, I only have a video of this uh, 
particular guitar bot on the internet. It's just some guy with an iPhone who just uh, types into the computer to play his favorite song. You know, he went to iBeam, wherever this uh, guitar was hanging out, and he just went over to a janky computer, typed in the song, and then just got his iPhone. And then this this thing is just on the floor over here. You know, it's just like, you know, just art, rusty art at that point. And it, it plays the song. And it's just funny how this black background, you know, professional stainless steel look can just be a, you know, something that's just uh, in a box. Here's the link for uh, the Midi-tron. It also comes in Midi-tron wireless, but who do I want to drop 400 bucks for that? It's probably a better idea just to hack a, a wireless keyboard and just wear it on your back and connect solenoids to it. And those cost like 10 bucks or less. I'm not gonna show you a Facebook nonsense, but this uh, particular viral nonsense video uh, recently surfaced on the internet and everyone's posting nonsense about it. But as you can see, it's a, it's a quadrupod marionette system. And so all you have to do is just, uh, you can see how many linkages there are. There's like uh, parallel linkages connected to both knees, both feet, both elbows, both hands, so that the, the Queen of Hearts there can have her, her four automata, uh, you know, be her uh, you know, backup girls for this is Yankee. And, and just for effect, they put a uh, marionette head on that has like the, the nutcracker jaw. So it's, it's pretty intense, you know, over the top piece of art. I don't know why they didn't bother just to, to put up a a black background, backgrounder, because there's just a fan in the background. You know? I hardly feel like that's everything I wanted to show you, but I also have uh, tons of videos about uh, cellular automata and other other things that I've done. So I'm gonna try to set that up. From the top. Uh, no particular order. This is a particular piece where I uh, made like vector versions of every single. Why not? Every single letter, and the, each one of those letters is a hand drawn little thing. And then um, put it in the computer to have it uh, recombine and uncombine. So I, I just made a you know, polygons. Each one of the letters is like too many polygons. And then from there you can do any transform you want. I did lots of other more interesting kind of rotational ones. Because if you think about it, like as a digital artist, what are your, uh, what is your palette of tools? And really you got scaling, and you got rotating. That's pretty much all you got. Scaling as x and y at the same time makes a, a square into a bigger square. Scaling of just x turns a square into a rectangle. I'll probably show you more about this piece uh, sooner or later. But it's, a, it's just a rotating piece of uh, plastic and it's on a disc that was originally from like a subwoofer. And uh, it's back, back projected through these black stencils. And then there's a gel in front of each one. We each have a little, little zodiac sign in the negative space, the white none. So uh, making this particular black print on, on plastic and gluing it around the circle, uh, you know, it's working in negative space. Sometimes light art, you have to make everything but what your light is, because the light's, you know, 
pretty pure, transparent stuff. Oh, and the trick for this one is that uh, it's got one slip ring on the inside, which is just really uh, um, low quality components, I guess, you know, it'd be better. But all it is is a, like a circle of copper, and then that's connected to the, the, the shaft. And then the rope shader on top of it is just kind of like a clump circle of uh, steel wool or something. So it's just, it's just friction slip ring. Well, they all are, but you can just set up a, two concentric rings, and if there's some tension, then you'll get electricity into a, a rotating system. And then the other electricity, the other side of it, other than the negative, there's a little piece of steel wool right here. Right there and right there. Each one of these lights has a copper prong protruding from right in front of the light. And so that's just uh, flapping against uh, this uh, steel wool runner. So the electricity only plays on the stuff in the front. Here you go. Time uh, record of me just uh, tapping the screen to put positions down, and then there's a fade time set for how how long the uh, squares are effective. And if you think about it, the square and the uh, circle are they're just a different drawing command for the same thing, which ends up being a, a square if you're working in like Cartesian coordinates. So um, you know by the end. Usually I'm, I'm done using a program by the time it just works great and never opening it up. So by the end, it just looks like a super Mattis art, stuff that Mondrian was doing by hand, like one a week. But you know, these days you can click on a computer and get, you can even auto generate them. Like what's the difference? I'll hold off on that one until I show you another one. So this is like 2007, you know, like five, six years ago, I was doing these. They're like paint fill programs. I, I think uh, they're really enjoyable to make because you just, uh, I like to think of them as uh, ants eating like the sugar of a picture. So there's these little green dots you can barely see and then each one of those green dots has interactions to other green dots that are within, you know, say like 50 pixels of it. So when you uh, un unveil it on a, a symmetrical picture, you usually get a circle. And the program just eats all the white stuff away and then uh, it just keeps moving. And you know, the, all these different nodes, they, they might look like nodes, but all they do is set up uh, locations nearby them to, to look for color again. And whenever it finds color, it consumes it. Here's an example of a cellular automata. Each one of these frames is generated from the previous frame, and the whole video is just generated from like one point in the middle. That just expands. By the time it reaches the walls, the, the system becomes corrupt, because if you think about what a wall is, like the end of space, in, a, in this system, I have a grid, you know, there's a bunch of ones memory itself or the white light space is just a bunch of ones. But if you think about what it is when you hit the corner, there's a couple things it could be. There's no new memory there. So what your memory might end up being is the most recent thing in memory. So it would be corrupt because it's just uh, going to start becoming an artifact. What else could it be? It could be, uh, you could want it to be uh, an overlap so that this point becomes this point. So that you have like a, a tile world. But if you think about what that would mean for the corner, the corner has no absolute tiling. Like this tile's there, but this tile's here. 
So it's inferring a non-space, the exact left corner, upper left hand, lower right hand, or upper right hand. Those are inferred spaces that don't exist. Because as soon as you ask what this position is, like uh, theoretically, it's either like this upper left right hand corner, or it could be this uh, lower right hand corner. You know, there's like, all these non-spaces. So oftentimes the best solution rather than fixing the problem is just to make a bigger memory bank so you never encounter the, the error. So for the, these, uh, these little videos of the black and white, they're all just rule sets. And for this particular uh, automatic, there's only 256 different rule sets, because rule sets are what you do when you have one friend, two friends, three friends, four friends, five friends, six friends, seven friends, eight friends. So it's just an eight-bit system. Maybe seven bit. So that means that permutationally there can only be 256 uh, different animations I can show you if, all, if my rule is like follow the same law for the whole video. But just like when I was telling you with the semantics, the sometimes the coolest thing you can do is say you have like a nice mandala because you're playing 400 hertz. And say up at like 7,000 hertz you have another nice mandala, then what you can do is just play both at once or play one and then monophonically, you know, at whatever portamento you want, go to the other one. And uh, you're going to force change, you're going to force state changes that are, uh, you know, very, very fine and delicate. Digital computers might not even have that. But uh, these computer, uh, this computer program with the cellular automata here, the same rule was in effect for the entire, the entire playback. But every frame you could have followed a different rule. Now all of those, those flickers, those are rule sets that did not um, reprocreate anything. From, from a blank slate of white, they can't do anything. So you know, you could say on arbitrarily, maybe like 100 of the 200 had the ability to do something at all from a black or from a white state. And then the computer program is just set to say, if, uh, if the frames haven't really done anything after like five frames, then just skip to the next rule. Because I just have a computer automatically generate these for a night or two, because it's pretty processor intensive. If this grid's like 200 by 200, and every frame you have to look at, what is that, you know? say 100,000 points or 40,000 points, 40,000 computations for every frame. You know, any, any big numeric like that, you're, you're not even gonna wanna get coffee. You just have a computer uh, run all night and just not, not even concern yourself with it. And just hope, you know, it didn't glitch out. Uh, it's far too many gigabytes to show you, but I did a, a color transform of, of the cellular automata so that, say, uh, because they're black and white. So what I could do is just say all time ones, like the now is now the blue channel. And then like the most recent picture is the red channel. And then the second most recent picture is the yellow channel or the green channel. That way uh, every, every new frame has a little feedback of what it used to be that helps to make it uh, lit with uh, you know, some context. So I showed you those like ant following films and uh, this one happens to be uh, uh, pretty much taking the, the polygons that the ants decoded. You know, you just store those up, and then you make polygons out of them, and then you do like little recursive transforms to them. So the uh, the particular mandala, which is just from a kid's uh, drawing book, you know, scan it, uh, and then drop this digital rain on it to you know get a vector transform of it, and then uh, from there, you know, keep keep using it. The source material. Uh, it just gets filtered again. Here's a funny uh, kids toy game that I put onto a, you know, a pretty messy plate. And it seems like, just like um, uh, Benjamin Cowden's work, like art for a machinist usually is uh, a motherboard. And then from that you have to you know, create kind of like either the Rube Goldberg setup or the architecture. So this is just kids toys, but the, the trick I did was that I digitally uh, computed these circles. And these circles have as many uh, spectrum flavors of the rainbow 
as uh, as they do gears, uh, gear teeth. So theoretically, you know, the the digital print on top of the gears is the equivalent of the uh, the gear it's on, and then they're interacting in a in a cyclic way, just like the the Mayan calendar, say, where it's got a a ring of say 20 days over 13 months or something or 13 numbers over 20 months and then that means that if they rotate on each other then after 260 uh, unique points of uh, you know uh, combination then they, they, they cycle again to the first day of the year uh, here's Sometimes I'll just be using the computer to generate uh, some art, and then I'll have like a print that emerges. But I don't just want the print; I want uh, I just want what the algorithm can do. So this particular model I showed Sam once—it's uh, just a, a record that might be printed in copper or something. And uh, but once you have the the program generated to make the particular one you're after, you can just tweak the variables, and it'll also make you know, a thousand other programs of very similar a definition. Uh, as far as vector transforms go, uh, if you ever uh, worked in Flash, they have this thing called tweening, where you can take one vector or one polygon, say it's an A, and a polygon is just like a string. It might end up being an animal. You know, like a cat polygon would just be like the unbroken line. And at some point, or actually at any point, it could be the, the loop, the tape loop. So you take a polygon of the letter A. So naturally, you're going to have to cut out a hole like that to make it an unbroken line. Then you take a polygon of B. And then you can crossfade those. So this particular, uh, and then it's called interpolation sometimes. Like uh, you can automatically do it in computers where you say, here's one set of numbers and here's another set of numbers. Now just go between, like wax between, crossfade between that entire list to the next list. So this particular video is uh, the entire alphabet as a source material, and then every direction out is the entire alphabet again, but in the middle it's only one letter at a time. Might be hard to see. So W uh, polygonically transforms into every letter. So every letter transforms into every letter if you watch the whole video. And a lot of it, uh, the letters just get crushed. But sometimes you can see like this hybrid P, like when the B turns into the P, Perhaps uh, all it does is just uh, kind of like a slide whistle, take take the, the hoop up up the uh, vertical. But uh, there's a there's a fun and creative zone in digital art where you work with inside out shapes. In uh, in Flash, when they wanted you to do tweening and they hadn't really worked it out how to how to make the algorithm always work perfectly, you get a lot of artifacts. You just uh, kind of like ring bring digital shirts out and then just go inside out and just completely, you know, go wrong. So they started doing things with uh, tracking key points where you'd say, like, I want the, the center of the A to always be at a specific area that's kind of close to the centers of the B. And then the computer would more intelligently be able to crossfade instead of always getting trapped in a, in a, a really screwy inside out zone if, if the points don't all uh, work together. Even if you do a circle like that, and you try to crossfade to a circle like this, just changing the beginning point to the end point from there to there, like that's going to go there, that's going to go there, that's going to go there, it's just going to be the wrong transition. Compared to kind of like a one-to-one, -one, like the left lower always goes to the left lower. So it's just like about keeping your numbers clean, I guess, or, or tidy. Here's another one of those uh, year programs.
and that's it because it, it had no way to track out to those um, farther out whites. The uh, unsymmetrical ones are usually the coolest. Like this one turns into like this weird biplane. And just like in Photoshop, if you do contigu to new contiguous paint filling, you can find out what parts of the picture are inaccessible from all those other points. Okay, so maybe like a year ago I did this one. Everyone's earliest video game experience is like a black screen and white text back in the 80s or 70s is just a, a game that's just a bunch of dots. Uh, some of them are called roguelikes, where you're just like the letter A and like for adventurer, and then you fight Zs for zombies and stuff. But if anyone tries to take a, the first programming class and they're just bent on making a game, usually they have to make a text-based game, because that's the, the closest thing to a visual controller you have right out of the library, just, just spewing text and just con kind of keeping it like a consistent memory so it looks like an you know, adventure navigatable space. So this is a ray tracing program. All it does is uh, draw selectively this blue circle. So it starts from the center and then goes out in every single direction. And you'll notice that there's uh, artifacts of the, uh, the resolution of the, the polar transform. Because like, really close to where the, the dude is, there's, uh, there's tons of overlap. If you look for uh, 100 pixels and there's like the first ring only has 8, then you're looking at all of those 8 pixels 20 times accidentally. So there's overlap. Whereas once you get out to like 40 points, then you start seeing that speckle, which is an interesting speckle. You'll see it often. It's uh, kind of like a Van Allen belt. You've seen this pattern before. It's like the opposite of a circle. And it's generated by shooting out rays from the center. And then after a while, there's no more overlap. And then the empty holes start to be triggered. Kind of cool so this might have been uh, a little bit like a cellular automata in that it really has to look at every pixel on the screen. There's some really amazing Russian early video games that are super immersive even though they're just a bunch of uh, text on the screen because they have a, a ray tracing unit in it so that you feel like you're navigating around the space and the space uh, is based on, on who you are, where you are. So uh, as, as a light artist, you got to play with different colors of light. So uh, the easiest three colors are RGB. So I set up uh, three different light sources, theoretically. And you'll notice if you look really closely, you can't see them really, there's these three points, red, green, and blue. And those are where the, uh, the three characters, the three light sources are traveling around. And so every once in a while, you're going to see pure black, or the closer and the darker it gets represents a space that is not lit by any light. And uh, all the walls in this particular zone are kind of like uh, gummy worms. But it's pretty cool. You're getting, you're getting uh, negative space shapes constantly that are, are sl uh, very dependent on just the, the lay of the land, which is just generated by a bunch of uh, mouse uh, drags on the screen. Here's some uh, negative space art that uh, I've showed you in only picture form before. Just the, a simple bearing on, on the middle and then uh, I took a piece of sheet metal and cut out zigzags of it. And if you do it right, you can cut uh, one piece of metal into zigzags and then just uh, char out, crack out the two different sides and then just weld those together and then uh, you turn one piece of metal into two. I'm sure you know. As long as you leave a lip on the bottom and the top, you can just uh, carve out the, any any complementary shape from itself. You know, pretty much any complementary shape, except for like uh, if you did 
like circles, you end up getting these kind of uh, castle castle walls. It's not symmetrical necessarily. But there's this one part in the video towards the end that I really like, where the the camera itself is moving inside of the object, and it, it start. I, I turn the camera at about the same speed that the uh, the object's moving. So uh, the relative space or the, the relative context of the movie all of a sudden becomes the the change, and then the background becomes the thing that's spinning. Might be hard to see. Uh, as, far as, as far as polygons go, uh, a lot of the coolest transforms that we do in uh, Illustrator or the CSG is uh, merging or, or uh, intersecting two polygons. And in, in most of the programs we, we have, we just press a button and then stagnantly two things become one. Which, which in a way is kind of boring. You can't make animations out of it. So in this this video, I, I uh, present. I've got the algorithm going that uh, interactively and in, like in live real time merges two rotating polygons. And you can see from the video, occasionally that it uh, it doesn't work exactly right. Like you'll get these frames where there's crossovers, where the like the smooth geometry breaks down because my my rule for where where the uh, the boundary is isn't isn't like super perfect at this point. S still got some failings. But it's, it's an OCD thing. You make a program that's not exactly uh, accounting for all states of of, the, of a system's uh, interaction, and you can look around and try to try to fix it. Supposedly. Uh, if you have a thought in your mind, you can you can uh, kind of dismantle it and then recompose it from from uh, certain primary possibilities that a computer can accomplish. But but philosophically, it's not necessarily possible that something that you kind of metaphorically think of could be uh, al algorithmically uh, parallel, because you might have a thought that you know we're, we're pretty capable of abstract thought, and there might be thoughts that not necessarily have a, a coherent uh, algorithm. So it's slowing down right now, and you can kind of see how every once in a while, they're actually sped up. See all those crossovers? Like, I'm, I'm trying to weed those out. And see now it's not as fluid. So it's kind of like distilling uh, logic sometimes, where you have something that's just going awry, and you're just tracking down the error. But um, a lot of programs don't have that, that underlying picture. Like I'm doing this visual expansion thing, but underneath it there is uh, polygons that are, are honing in on like the last output and the last input of, uh, of the intersection. And, and so that information I, I put there right in the middle visually to help me see if the program was erroring in different ways. Here's that exact same uh, polygon interpolation program, but this time it's for uh, geometry of numbers and a couple of party symbols like hearts and stars. Uh, there's lots of fun to be had doing tracking algorithms. This one's not really too visible. Since it's just a sine wave machine, generating a bunch of little red points. And then it has these moving trackers that all they know particularly is where they are and where they used to be. And then every new frame of places that they can be, they choose the place that is closest to where their previous uh, you know, memory was. So they only have like one, one little iota of, of memory or of, of awareness. And oftentimes they oscillate 
Sometimes it's fun. You'll see uh, at the right sine wave, sometimes they, they'll all clump. That's also something that it does occasionally. But on the right kind of sine wave, sometimes they end up being like passerbyers that are doing uh, uh, almost like the crossroads of a street where they will be going left and then all of a sudden they'll go right and then they'll go left and then they'll go right and then they'll go left. So they almost try to hold a, a, a consistent overlap. Or they, they just seem more interactive. A lot of times they just you know try to drag out to the corner and just do the least amount of work possible. But every once in a while the program says, you know, this node is interactively kind of resonating with, with the, uh, the space that it's inhabiting. So like this one right here is the best. There's that little purple guy in the middle who's like, I'm left, I'm right, I'm left, I'm right. But luckily, most systems, you know, there's a, or even like, yeah, if you just throw a bunch of rocks into a, some water, you know, it's, there'll be one that'll start floating. You won't know why. There's just variation. So this is a, a funny hybrid piece of art. It's got some digital to it. It's got some uh, analog. As far as circuits go, all it is is a row of lights. And those lights are are changing based on the touching of a record, a metal record on the, the bottom. And the lights are only off because the copper is uh, rubbing against paint on the metal rather than the bare metal. And if you're lucky, you can see, because I put some digital feedback in it, what it's doing is it's taking the lower video. Say I recorded uh, on a camera, and the intelligent information is down here. And then what I want to do is take, like, say, this 100 pixel zone, and just move it up so that it goes here, and then that one goes there, and that one goes there. So all it is is a draw operation that takes this area of the video field, and then for the next frame, it just moves it up right there. And the and then the new information is allowed to take over this whole area. And then by the, the second frame, the feedback is we've got a new slice of the, the, back, or the lower side. So there's this, this, uh, this little attenuation where it's allowed on uh, new input, and then all the stuff has is, is slowly just a um, channel upwards. But this is doing with video, so it's a giant matrix. If you wanted to do with data itself, there's a great object called L rotate, L L R O R, and all it does is it takes a list and then it just shuffles so that the end of it goes to the beginning constantly. So for the the automata. Sometimes uh, I, I'd spend it. It's been generating them by just uh, dropping a seed in the center and then it would just expand. But uh, the other way that you can look into them is just uh, just running running the pattern and then changing the rules while it's running. So yeah, this looks like kind of like old TV feedback, but it's it's just like algorithmically cell, cell operations. But one of the rules I can tell you just from looking at this is that if you have no, like if uh, you have a, no neighbors that are white except for your lower center neighbor, then you become white yourself. Like if you're black and then there's a, a white below you, and that's it, then, then you become white. Just by looking at this, I can tell you that. But the, uh, there's probably like seven other rules, and you just turn them on and off. Occasionally, the system will will just change what its standing pattern is. Now, uh, when I play this video, I hope you can see that every once in a while something turns gray. I I personally uh, think of them they're they're called fluorescent gray, and what it means is that there's a, a flickering back and forth between. 
black and white consistently. So it's just on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So occasionally they, they emerge. And if you, if you look at this field, you can occasionally almost uh, convince yourself that you see, say, people walking around or kind of like animal crackers. It's kind of fun to just decode uh, components of, of a chaos, which this might be. But uh, sensorily, the computer has no idea what it's, what it's doing. It's just uh, in inheriting rules like an assembly line worker. And then we exist on like a meta level where like the concept of, of fluorescent gray doesn't, it's not even perceived by the computer and you'd have to really work at it. You have to use like blob detection and then uh, have to verify that the, the blobs are flickering. That'd be a lot of work. A lot of times, you just end result, you end up getting Sierpinski triangles, which is a standard fractal form. I think there's a couple of different standard fractals here, all that we can see. Hopefully, you know that Sierpinski is kind of like this uh, self repeating upside down, right side up triangle. All you gotta do is draw the inside out, or uh, triangles inside of triangles. Generate a door using programs that uh, make certain entities. I think there's a couple more uh, standard fractals, but uh, the one that I'll tell you next is the. Uh, it's just a, the, the cut line. Any line you can just cut it at a, at a midpoint and then offset that midpoint manually, and then you can recursively just do that again where you just take, you can do a midpoint or a random point, and then you just offset that uh, very good. And now you have two computations. And now you can cut there and there and there and there, and then you offset those random points. And just from, you know, uh, procedurally altering a straight line, it just starts to, you know, turn into noise. Supposedly fractals are self-similar, which means if you look at them really close up and really far, far away, they have the same design, which is probably comforting. There's a Pythagoras fractal that's usually based on gosh, I forget how I was generating it. It always ended up looking like it was falling in a rhythm. It's like a tree with one arm. I think next time I'll, I'll show you some more fractals because they're kind of spatially active. Pythagoras fractals kind of just looking like a, a fern. And then there's the famous uh, dragon fractal that was in uh, the first page of the cover of uh, Jurassic Park. Probably as a metaphor for, you know, take mosquito DNA and uh, just let it take its like fractal course and then it can reemerge. Or no, they took uh, blood samples from what was inside the mosquito to bring back an ancient chaos, kind of. But usually they're just based on, like the dragon crackle, I think, is a, uh, maybe they just like take lines and then uh, cut them in half and then just generate a, uh, new, new points from a fractured skeleton. And sometimes they flip flop, so like one time it, it uh, branches left and one time it branches right. So this is just a one second loop of video, but it shows you that there's a kind of standing forms. You can obviously say it's moving left, it's moving down, and that the, the forms are, are uh, stable. Some of them are, others flicker. And it's really easier to generate this stuff if you work in a small matrix. Notice how the, the rim of this particular checkerboard is kind of stable. The rim always has a, a kind of a different take on what, what the system is because it doesn't have a full deck to, to choose its new state from. 
as I was saying, especially the lower lower corners and upper corners. In this particular state, it looks like things are, are falling both down and to the left. But, you know, they have optical illusions that people interpret completely differently. Uh, as far as painful operations go, here's a little example of a, a program I made that just slowly, pixel by pixel, uh, fills up the space. And I think I, I did it so that it was color coded, perhaps, so that uh, some, something based on like how many searches it had to do to find that new space, or how attractive that space was, was uh, just you know offset the color. So you can, you can see that there's a strange little uh, diamond tower from, from the get-go. Diamonds and crosses are, are visual in what seems to be just an expanding chaos. So I was you know, interactively drawing more things for it to uh, have to get past. Now watch has this thing, like it folds around the corner, like all the other directions die. Perhaps I turn down the rules of tolerance you know, for how many times you're gonna keep checking. Or oftentimes what happens is that you only have 256 memory points to keep looking. And almost like a, a trump card will happen where if one area just ha takes the, the first 256 uh, points in a, in the search, then all the other places just never get a chance to update, and then it, uh, it grows from this corner only. So uh, you open up Photoshop and you click on the screen, and it instantaneously does a very streamlined, optimized algorithm just like this. But uh, with, within this algorithm, if you give it some attention, one of the coolest things you can do is downsample it, make the algorithm less efficient so that it, it in itself is an automata. And if you make it less efficient, if you make it so that it, it dies often and it grows often, then the coolest thing that it ends up doing is just uh, start expanding in seaweed patterns, which are actually more efficient than looking everywhere redundantly. If, if you have a certain... Uh, search trains, they, they're always a little bit more, uh, more positive than negative, but ne never negative uh, takes hold, so that just says, uh, says I'm, I'm done, I'm out of memory. Oh yeah, and some of my coolest work, I think, uh, is, is downsampling engines. A computer knows too much, it's got too much access to all the information, but if you, you slow it down, like this particular video is of a, I suppose a spider that's traveling around this uh, little digital space from a game called Legend of Calandria. And uh, the thing below is just a polygon field that's, it's got this little breath oscillation to it, but it, it is inherently just maybe 20 uh, color values. And then it's, it's uh, oscillating this cool uh, cross-faded shapes. So it's got this breathing thing that makes you maybe think, hopefully it's kind of like a living being. And then you can see the, the tentacles of it are, are the exact colors, like what it's covering up is the exact colors of what you're seeing. So, you know, whenever you see a fly or, or animals are, are walking around and you wonder like what they're aware of, you could use a computer to help you think about how they think. It's, it's pretty fun to de-resolution uh, video. I think the first time I did it was, a, again, the movie Videodrome. I think I mentioned the last time because of one of the, the TV uh, living scenes. But this time it was because they, they wanted to make uh, a helmet that Pearson goes on and they go into like a dream world. And before we really digital had, had too much of an influence, they said it cost like a couple thousand dollars to engineer 
the de-resolution effect on, on video. Because video had just been uh, standardized to be, say, like 500 pixels big. You know, if you're going to say the equivalent of an analog signal, it's like 500 by 400 on all TVs. But the pixels didn't exist. It was uh, still magnetic ray points. And so they did the first de-resolution or, de or pixelation uh, of video as, as just a, an effect. So here I'm just rubbing the, uh, the, the castle or the, the citadel in the background. Walking around, walking around. The final part right here I, I think is the coolest. I was also playing with the, uh, see the, the polygons, they're kind of coming apart. It's like a, a clenching grasshopper at this point. But uh, searching around the databank for the best video to do this to, and then this, this fire bit video showed up. It was kind of metaphorical, you know, why, why do animals go towards fire and whatnot? Yep, so how many, how many squares are those? It's just a tiled square of, of 50 or 60 motion polygons, but they, in a way, become uh, inherently aware or like what you perceive of them is like a, a certain kind of acknowledgement of yeah, like kind of like an or, organic reaction to what, what those colors would be rather than just every pixel is one little square. You know, choose a couple pixels and, and do something cool with them. And it's, it's uh, far more involved. On my website, it might be hard to find, but I Documented and you can download it if you want to ever try out Max. Uh, it's at max slash fastfill.htm. I wanted to show you uh, the programs that kind of went behind this, as well as I only have two pictures right now. I, I would would love to go back to this old program and just mine it for what it would do. This is just dropping uh, dropping one point. developing in a still frame. So that's the funny thing is that this entire, you know, it was a video. You can see the video in a way if you just look at this because all it is is just adding one pixel at a time. And you can, you can see the whole video in this one frame. So it's a lot of processing just for this one picture. But the funny thing is, is that if you didn't want to, you could just tell the computer to not, you know, in memory you have to process this, but you don't even have to render it um, visually for you. You can just leave uh, a thousand steps for the computer to do, and then you just, all, all you really want to look at is the last step. So for these max patches, which is just software that you invent yourself, and you just set up these numbers that, that are, are your kind of thresholds, the ones that are, are most important, you know? Say it's like at two and it's working okay, so you make it a floating point and change it to 2.3 and then it's, it's lasting a little longer. So oftentimes just tweaking the system so that uh, you find what numbers, they're kind of like if you're uh, circuit bending, you gotta find what points on the chip are, are good. Do you see? In mathematics, you know, that's what I get done in math. Just uh, searching for uh, transforms that are, uh, you know, beholding cool possibilities. Oh, this computer's not on the net. Oops.
Oh, I unplugged it. Luckily, we're kind of So uh, yeah, we're here for a little bit longer, but if anyone wants to look over algo do with me or uh, do anything on the computers here before we go across town to the art lab. You can get an electric football kit for like 20 bucks in the Bay Area. I don't know if it's worth that much, but you know, you saw that, that tackle, that was pretty intense. Oh yeah, the new version of Algodoo's out. Just so you know, uh, the highlights of it are that wind is now available in the air menu. There's bug fixes. There's a direction picker for gravity. There's wind and object velocity. A couple things. But uh, the patches I gave you, you should be able to see the, the double oscillating uh, pump, which is actually historically something that they've, they've done. Usually they suspend the, uh, the objects over water and then they just like undulate back and forth. And then the waves themselves are, they have like rudders in the waves. And so that the waves uh, help bring the water out of the waves. It's kind of a neat trick. And the last thing I don't think I talked about, it just got lost in the shuffle, was uh, the Conway patterns. Some people are so into the Conway game that they've documented all of these different, and they've given them little pet names, all these little uh, um, stable shapes in the game of life. Like, if you have one of those, it'll flicker to look like this, and then this will be like a stable system. Whenever you have these four, the next frame is those, and the next frame is those. As long as I'm not perturbed by something outside. So there's a list of hundreds of, of shapes or almost like metaphorical onomatopoeias, like people see faces or see, see uh, like an in, in, in immersive or immersive intelligence map. They'll, they'll see something that looks like it's almost communicating to them. And then they'll document it in a, you know, it's like a, Theo Jansen was setting up the, uh, kind of like that biological um, encyclopedia of, of all of these monsters. Call it like Rhinoceros mobilius. But uh, there's a big word for it. The simpler word is just anthropocentric. We just see human in things, or, or, or see life in things, even if it's inanimate. There's a, a recent video where uh, some computer scientists just decided to put a, a stick on a motor and then just have a person sit in the room and there's a stick on a motor that's got like uh, me and Ma and stuff that can just do things. And then we just say, okay guy, sitting in this room with a stick, talk to the stick, tell us, tell us about the stick, like tell us what you feel from the stick. And then so this guy would just be sitting here and he'd say, I think the stick's trying to attack me. I, I think Things waving at me, and then they wave at the stick and stuff. And they're kind of prompt, prompted to do that, but on a certain level, you know, you can't help but want to see things. There's a bigger word, I'll find out what it is next time, but instead of just saying that we, uh, we see or we embed humanity in everything, there's another one that says that we, we see faces in any, everything. It's a pretty sweet idea. Uh, the guy showed me some experiments about the, uh, who's the a uh, polymer composite chemist in Ontario, California, and in LA. And uh, aside from making really cool resins, he would uh, put magnetic particles in his resins, along with pigment. 
and then put it on a piece of plexiglass, and then put a magnet underneath the plexiglass, and then move things around. And so there's like a un unperturbed by the human hand part, part invented sterilely by, by magnetism itself. And so you take a circle and you wave it around, and you get these, these delicate little uh, particle movements that the, the human hand can never accomplish. So you, you just end up being like dragon. Everything you did, you just like take a piece and then move it out like it was a, a smoky uh, beard or, or a whiny form. And it, it was just, it was everything that they did would look like faces, you know? So like when you see something complex, you can try to see the, uh, the identity, which often has to do with uh, just seeing a smiley face, you know? Seeing the angle of the uh, perturbance on the eyebrows. And it's kind of involved with the, uh, the whole Shroud of Turin thing. Like, everyone's seeing uh, Mary in the spaghetti or the omelet, you know? You just look for faces, hope, hope to see them. Is that it? I think there's one more thing. Oh, yeah. That uh, Murakami guy. Just uh, on a tangential note, uh, he's got the character named Dog. He's like post apocalyptic Mickey Mouse. He looks like this. It's kind of like a, a loon. It's got a huge mouth like that sometimes. Shark teeth. But he could be anyone. He's like a hallucination. He, sometimes he has three eyes, sometimes he has a thousand eyes. Part of super flat art is maybe something to do with mutation or interpretation. And so a lot of the drawings of dog have just like a thousand eyes. And I love it because you can take any two eyes and then contextualize the face from it. And so looking at one of these pieces, just like my, uh, my fastball um, hate-filled drawings, uh, you can kind of read into it. Like every two eyes is a face. So this, this multi-channel uh, identity is just, you know, one picture. 